Is The Nightmare Before Christmas a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie? That's the million dollar question that can cause a debate among fans of the film with fair points in either direction. Regardless of what the answer is for you, tis the overall season for the film anyway. And 30 years later, The Nightmare Before Christmas has cemented itself as one of the classic films for fans on either side of the question to at least watch once a year. It's dark but charming, spooky but joyous. It plays around with the concepts and feelings felt between both of the holidays holidays to create something new all its own. The film went from something loved and appreciated in the 90s to a pop culture phenomenon throughout the 2000s, where it could define a large era of hot topic. The characters and their designs became instantly recognizable, the music has stuck itself in the ears of the generations that followed the release of it, and now Jack Skellington himself is in Fortnite! Okay, that last point isn't really on the same level as the others, but it does prove that the popularity of the character and the film is still alive 30 years later since the initial release of it. The film couldn't have reached the cult following it has amassed without the incredibly talented people who brought it to life, the insane journey they went on to design the film, and create the music that all companied together made for something completely unique and always worth exploring. So today, I wanted to revisit this holiday classic and talk about what made it so special for me, and probably many others, for it to live on such a highly held pedestal. <laughs> Tim Burton originally wrote a poem back in 1982 that was about three pages long, while at the time working in the animation field already for Disney. It was inspired by several Christmas classics that he would watch, but it would infuse his signature gothic style that led to it having the themes of both Halloween and Christmas. He had just finished working on his stop motion film called Vincent that was received really well, so when he would show his creation of the poem along with some accompanying art through storyboards and concept designs to another person working as a Disney animator at the time as well, well, Henry Selleck, Disney would start putting some interest into whatever this idea was. But Tim wasn't sure what The Nightmare Before Christmas exactly was just yet. Was it a children's book? Was it a short film like Vincent? It wasn't clear where the vision lied since it wasn't fully fleshed out just yet. But things now would hit a snag. The further Tim would work on this idea with Disney, it became clear to the company that it may not fit the exact mold they would want to present under their signature banner. So in the 80s, the project pretty much just stopped and nothing further than that happened with the development. After a couple years and no further movement on the project for it being just too weird and out there for Disney, he was let go from the company. This time away, however, would serve as a massive rise in who Tim Burton was as a household name in Hollywood, creating another cult classic film with Beetlejuice before he would go on to bring the Dark Knight to the big screen with Batman. Jeffrey Katzenberg, the at the time chairman of Walt Disney Studios, wanted to build off of both the rise of Tim Burton's name and the studio's own hot streak of animation and now Disney seemed pretty on board to try and work with the concept of the project, which was great as Tim would reconnect with Henry and the vision they would have for The Nightmare Before Christmas would be to make it a feature film. And even though it's called Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Henry would be the one to helm the project as the director. Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, coming to theaters everywhere. It goes something like this. It's 1991 now and the project would begin production. And what a production it was. Building the sets to specific scales and interlinking parts for better assembly and positioning across 20 sound stages is no easy task for a film that would have over 100,000 different frames to create the whole thing. Along with that, there were over 200 different character models created, all with multiple and distinctly different head sculpts and facial expressions, with Jack himself having nearly 400 alone. Stop Stop motion is a very tedious task to accomplish, which aside from having to go and work on the sequel to Batman, became a driving factor in Tim not wanting to direct it. Over the multiple year production, Tim Burton only was around a handful of times to make sure they would make what feels like a Tim Burton film. It needed to have his initial designs and ideas, that gothic vibe to it, and the final result oozes that exact feeling. Danny Elfman was brought on naturally, who instantly had the music pour out of him, having Tim's designs drive how the music would sound. He he also would be the voice of Jack Skellington when he would have to sing, taking over for a bit from Chris Sarandon. Come October 1993, The Nightmare Before Christmas would premiere in theaters but under Disney's more adult-oriented banner of Touchstone Pictures, rather than Walt Disney Pictures, as there was still some concerns of the film being too dark and possibly too much for a younger audience to handle. So taking away the main Disney branding to it would in a way push away blame if younger audience couldn't handle it and if parents took issue with that. In later years, this 
would change. The film ended up becoming a massive success, and people loved it, and the merch surrounding it would go on to be one of the most marketable factors to the film's existence. So yeah, now Disney has no shame in putting the main Disney branding on it as a sign of finally backing the film. There's been subsequent re-releases in theaters, and of course they had to hop on the post-added in 3D trend, and they can always bank on these re-releases to earn millions more for the film from the fans always going to support it whenever it would pop up. Initially, the film made around $50 million on a $24 million budget, leading it to be considered a decent hit. But with all of the re-releases, the film has earned right under $100 million from theaters alone. This doesn't take into account the merch over the past 30 years and the home video sales to go along with that. Suffice to say, the film as a brand has made a stupid amount of money for Disney, and like I said, now the character is in Fortnite. Whatever deal Disney made with Epic has also led to a large amount of cash flow to the property, and yes, I did buy it. I have no shame. I am the perfect little pay pig they need me to be, and I won't apologize for it. At least for now. Maybe one day. Stay tuned for that. The film itself would follow the character of Jack Skellington, the pumpkin king of Halloween, who is pretty bored with the whole same celebrations every year for the holiday, seeking something new in his life. We also get to meet Sally, the creation of Dr. Finkelstein, who feels held back from not having her own freedoms, as the scientist claims she isn't ready for the world on her own yet, but notices Jack dealing with his woes from a distance. Jack eventually reaches a bunch of doors that lead him to different lands, all focusing on some sort of holiday on the calendar, when he ends up going through the Christmas one and enters into Christmas Town. They, they really have the most creative names for the towns, honestly. This new breath of fresh air for Jack has him mesmerized by nearly everything there, and maybe he found that change needed for what can be celebrated. Now, wanting to bring the Christmas spirit to Halloween Town for the others to enjoy. But the others back in town don't really see what's so great about this Christmas business anyway, that he's trying to sell them on. Until Jack brings up Santa, describing him as a monster, and then the town starts understanding what he's yapping about. Sally really isn't on board though, as she knows that this is gonna go completely wrong, but her warning isn't listened to, and the prep from everyone in town begins without thinking further on what's going on. Jack sends out the creepy trio of children here to kidnap Santa and bring him to Oogie Boogie in Halloween Town so Jack can assume the role of Santa himself. Jack tries to go and deliver all the presents to the regular world, but his presents are all filled with the Halloween spirit of horror, sending the world into panic and Jack being labeled this imposter Santa and literally gets shot out of the sky. Jack begins feeling sad about this, feeling like he ruined Christmas while Sally tries to set Santa free from Oogie's torture, but ends up captured alongside of him. Jack snaps out of his sorrow state once he realizes the thrill of the Halloween spirit is all he needs to be happy, and wants to get rid of his new role as Santa and become the Pumpkin King once more. So now he goes to rescue Santa and Sally, where he now has to deal with defeating Oogie, and then have a little chat with Santa, being sorry for what he's done, as Santa then begins fixing everything thanks to his magic and disappears away. And as to why he didn't just do that in the first place, maybe he just needed Jack to learn a lesson and reach this point on his own. Santa also gives Halloween Town the gift of snow. I'm not a fan of snow. This present sucks. I'd rather have the coal instead. Jack and Sally fall in love. I don't know. They just kind of do and we reach the end of the movie. On the surface, the story isn't super grand and there are things that kind of just happen to happen. But I feel why this movie has affected so many as the classic it's held up to be is the sheer charm and wonder of the stop motion animation, the wonderful music throughout from the score and the musical numbers, the incredible camera work, the performances of the cast of characters, and of course the aesthetic of it. Jack is a character who wants something more in his life and seeks out a way to try and find something new, having to learn what truly makes him happy. It's simple enough to resonate with the audience as many people hit this point in their lives or many times throughout their lives, and his struggle with this moves the plot forward. History making movie magic. Eureka! On sale now at a special low price. The solution he comes to for his feelings really just switches on a dime without any major reasoning to bring him to that moment, becoming this hero and returning back to who he was before. Not that he's this real bad guy, but he did do bad things, like the whole facilitating the kidnapping of Santa in the first place. The shallow story also applies to Sally, as she ends up getting the freedom she wants with Finkelstein, letting her go, as he just creates someone new for himself. There's plenty to nitpick here in the film when looking for further explanations or 
or logic, but that doesn't mean it's a bad movie or it isn't enjoyable. Like I said, the film creates this wonderful vibe throughout, and plus there's Zero, Jack's ghost dog, and he's adorable. You know, for essentially just being a bedsheet. There are also many iconic shots in this movie that are burned into your brain after seeing it, and the character designs are some of my favorite from any media in general because they all feel unique in the landscape of character designs in general. But even in the film, each character feels different from the others. There is so much to love here, but the story isn't super deep or developed to 100% tie all of the plots and themes together. But to the wonder and whimsy of it all, its simplicity still comes off enjoyable, and it allowed the visuals and music to really stand out as the shining factors of it. Maybe more can be explored in the future. There have always been talks about making a follow-up film, and with the size of the fan base for the film now, it's basically a near box office guarantee for Disney to greenlight. And it's only probably a matter of time before that actually happens. There was a sequel in the form of a book called Long Live the Pumpkin Queen that focused on Sally, which was released in 2022, with a sequel to that book coming in 2024, as well as a new graphic novel called The Battle for the Pumpkin King that came out this year, with a new traditional comic series in the works as well, and even recently this month in 2023, Henry seemed pretty interested in making a prequel about Jack becoming the Pumpkin King of Halloween, so who knows, especially with all this recent activity happening with the property. We do know that the merch has been a massive selling point over the past 30 years, from video games, toys, clothes, collectible trading cards, books, comics, and so much more that has contributed to making this once standalone film that Disney essentially passed on doing anything with a decade before it released into an established property with plenty more yet to explore. If we never get another proper film, that's still okay as well. The original film on its own still stands the test of time, but I'd never say no to exploring this magical world created a bit further on the big screen too. At the end of the day, The Nightmare Before Christmas truly is a special film that can be considered both a Christmas classic and a Halloween classic. No one should be judging you for watching it in either parts of the season or multiple times throughout. Could it have benefited from being more than it was, offering a story that goes deeper into who these characters are and why certain actions happen? Yeah, of course it could, but as it is, there is still so much magic baked into the truly impressive aspect of the film that makes it a fun watch every single time. But let me know how you feel about The Nightmare Before Christmas in the comments. Is it one of your favorites for the holiday season? And what do you consider it more, a Halloween film or a Christmas film, or both? I've been Jordan Fringe. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.